I'm going to start off here in the front row with John Gauman, Judith Ferrara, and Carol Stockmo, who bring us a tribute of the Worcester poet Stanley Kunitz today, who passed away at the age of 100, I believe, 2006. Hmm. All right. So we have Judith Ferrara, John Gauman, and Carol Stockmo. I'll tell you a little about each. Judith Ferrara is a writer, a poet, a visual artist who lives in Worcester with her husband, John Gaumond. Since 2009, she has been the volunteer researcher and docent program trainer coordinator at the Stanley Kunitz Boyhood Home. She writes a monthly blog on the creative process for her website, which is palettenpen.com. John Gaumond is a prize-winning poet and a photographer from Worcester. His poems have been published in several journals and he exhibits regularly at venues throughout Massachusetts. He is a volunteer docent at the Stanley Kunitz Boyhood Home in Worcester. Carol Stockmall is the owner-curator of the Stanley Kunitz Boyhood Home, where she and her late husband Greg have lived since 1979. A chance encounter in 1985 with a Pulitzer Prize winning poet and his wife resulted in a 20 year friendship. Their story forms the basis for docent tours and annual open house celebrations, which celebrate the legacy of Stanley Kunitz in Worcester. And in 2010, her home was designated as a literary landmark by the American Library Association. And I will, as an impersonal aside, I will mention I uh, had the privilege of attending the tour last year and brought a friend uh, who is interested, but not of the poetry world. And uh, to her, uh, how that tour touched her, it, it was to true tears. Uh, she was so moved by, by that tour. And now uh, a few words uh, before they come up for us. Stanley Kunitz, 1905 to 2006 his lifespan, was always at the top of Judith Ferrara and John Gauman's favorite poets list. They heard him read several times on Cape Cod where Kunitz summered and in Worcester where he was born. As members of the Worcester County Poetry Association, they met Greg and Carol Stockmall, the couple who bought what turned out to be Kunitz's childhood home. The Stockmall's friendship with Kunitz began with a pear tree that he and his mother planted in 1919. The Stockmalls transformed what Kunitz called the House of Sorrows to one of joy and reconciliation. He dedicated his poem, My Mother's Pears, to the Stockmalls. And when Greg died suddenly in 2008, Carol took on the challenge of maintaining the Kunitz legacy. An early decision was to continue the house tours that Greg began in 2005. She contacted the Worcester County Poetry Association and in March 2009 began meetings with Ferrara to develop a docent outline used to train volunteers to continue house tours and tell the story of the house and of their remarkable friendship. This presentation will highlight research discoveries and related poems of Stanley Kunitz. So please help me welcome to share more of the story, Carol Stockmall, Judith Ferrara, and John Gaumann. It's a pleasure to be here and share the poetry of Stanley Kunitz, as well as a bit of the research from the past three years. Our format today uh, will be that Carol or John will read one of four Stanley Kunitz poems. And then I will talk a little bit about it, and then they'll read it again. Uh, hopefully, this format will help, uh, will enrich your listening experience. And if you're not already familiar with the poems of Stanley Kunitz, I think you'll want to read more. In the past, literary critics have identified one of Kunitz's key themes as the lost father. And for example, in his poem, Father and Son, a line is about the house, the stucco one you built, and that refers to Carol's house. Today, I'd like to refocus a bit on the word mother. And if you think about that word, mother, it has emotional, cultural, and artistic reverberations and all. Stanley Kunitz's mother, Yetta, today, will be included in the ownership of events at the house on Woodford Street. 
as Cheryl just mentioned, Stanley Kunitz was born in 1905 in the bustling industrial city of Worcester. He and his family lived in the Jewish business district. His parents were Yetta, who was a dressmaker, and Solomon, who struggled to support his family by working at several small businesses. The Portrait. My mother never forgave my father for killing himself, especially at such an awkward time and in a public park that spring when I was waiting to be born. She locked his name in her deepest cabinet and would not let him out, though I could hear him thumping when I came down from the attic with the pastel portrait in my hand of a long-lipped stranger with a brave mustache and deep brown level eyes, she ripped it into shreds without a single word and slapped me hard. In my 64th year, I can feel my cheek still burning. Did you notice that word public? In the midst of her shocking loss, Yetta was seven months pregnant with Stanley and was left with two daughters, four and nine years old. This was a front page story and a reporter interviewed her for it. Solomon had died after drinking carbolic acid in Elm Park. She is quoted as saying that her husband had been ill for the last three years and had slept little. The previous night, he was restless and left the house about 11 o'clock in the morning, saying that he was not feeling well. We can think about how long, if ever, could it take for someone to recover from such an event. One might understand why Solomon's suicide was a subject never discussed in the widow's household. Fast forward. 100 years. When Stanley died in May 2006, family, friends, and poets gathered around his deathbed. Poet Sharon Olds was there and recently wrote the poem, Stanley's Mouth. Tells the story of her deathbed conversation with him. And, and he talked about writing the portrait and said, the first thing I did when I wrote it was read it to my mother. She didn't say anything. She wasn't a responsive person, but I saw her tension as she listened, and then she took it into her room with her. I felt punished. I never even met the fellow. I was born into sorrow. Let's imagine. Stanley's need to talk about this event, even as he lay dying. It seemed as fresh as the slap he received that day from his mother. The Portrait. My mother never forgave my father for killing himself, especially at such an awkward time and in a public park that spring when I was waiting to be born. She locked his name in her deepest cabinet and would not let him out, though I could hear him thumping. When I came down from the attic with the pastel portrait in my hand of a long-lipped stranger with a brave mustache and deep brown level eyes, she ripped it into shreds without a single word and slapped me hard. In my 64th year, I can feel my cheek still burning. An old crack tune. My name is Solomon Levi. The desert is my home. My mother's breast was thorny, and father I had none. The sands whispered, be separate. The stones taught me, be hard. I dance for the joy of surviving on the edge of the road. 
thorny, unresponsive, a preoccupied businesswoman struggling to make a living, <coughs> not affectionate. In his poem, My Sisters, it was they who gave Stanley comfort when he had nightmares. For the musicians and music lovers here, listen to the music in an old cracked tune. He wrote it to the rhythm of an anti-Semitic song he remembered from childhood called Solomon Levi. Stanley in an interview said, I wanted to redeem that odious song. It didn't occur to me until later that Solomon was my father's given name and that he was a Levite, a descendant of the priestly house of Levi. My driving impulse was to embrace a wounded name. But there is more truth to be told. The first line is, my name is Solomon Levi. When I obtained a copy of Stanley's birth certificate, I learned that he was born Solomon S. Kunitz. Stanley was making a secret declaration in the first line of this poem. In old crack tune, my name is Solomon Levi, the desert is my home. My mother's breast was thorny, and father I had none. The sands whispered, be separate. The stones taught me, be hard. I dance for the joy of surviving on the edge of the road. Three floors. Mother was a crack of light and a gray eye peeping. I made believe by breathing hard that I was sleeping. Sister's doughboy on last leave had robbed me of her hand. Downstairs at intervals, she played Varum on the baby grand. Under the roof, a wardrobe trunk whose lock a boy could pick contained a red Masonic hat and a walking stick. Bolt upright in my bed that night, I saw my father flying. The wind was walking on my neck. The window panes were crying. That's another poem rooted in music. It was written to Tchaikovsky's Varum, which is Russian for why. It was popular sheet music in the day. And yes, Stanley's sister, Sarah, would marry Percy Baker 11 months after the family moved into Woodford Street. It sounds as if uh, the 14-year-old boy was listening to her playing from his second floor bedroom. But when he visited Woodford Street, Stanley said that his bedroom was near the kitchen on the first floor. Well, we can agree that the poem is the poem completed with the proper poetic license needed to rebuild Woodford Street. And it is indeed a magnificent and heartbreaking poem. The real Woodford Street arrangement is found in the December 1919 mortgage describing for Woodford Street. Stanley and his family lived on the first floor. Co-owner Molly Siff and her family lived on the second floor with six rooms on the third floor divided between them for storage and two rooms for a tenant whose rent would pay for upkeep of the exterior, which is kind of an early version of a condo agreement. But the question remained, if Father Solomon had died two months before he was born, why did Woodford Street become a house of sorrows? Why were the window panes crying? Was there more than one fatherly ghost? Three floors. Mother was a crack of light and a gray eye peeping. I made believe by breathing hard that I was sleeping. Sister's doughboy on last leave had robbed me of her hand. Downstairs at intervals, she played Varum on the baby grand. Under the roof, a wardrobe trunk, whose lock a boy could pick, contained a red Masonic hat and a walking stick. 
bolt upright in my bed that night, I saw my father flying. The wind was walking on my neck. The window panes were crying. <clears throat> My mother's pears, plump green gold Worcester's pride, transported through autumn skies in a box marked handle with care. Sleep 18 Bartlett pears, hand picked and polished and packed for deposit at my door, each in its crinkled nest with a stub of stem attached and a single bright leaf like a flag. A smaller than usual crop, but still enough to share with me as always at harvest time. Those strangers are my friends whose kindness blesses the house my mother built at the edge of town beyond the last trolley stop when the century was young. And she proposed for her children's sake to marry again, not knowing how soon the windows would grow dark and the velvet drapes come down. Rubble accumulates in the yard. Workmen are hammering on the roof. I am standing knee deep in dirt with a shovel in my hand. Mother has wrapped a kerchief round her head. Her glasses glint in the sun. When my sisters appear on the scene, gangly and softly tittering, she waves them back into the house to fetch us pails of water. And they skip out of our sight in their matching midi blouses. I summon up all my strength to set the pear tree in the ground, unwinding its burlap shroud. It is taller than I. Make room for the roots, my mother cries. Dig the hole deeper. A chance meeting between the 80-year-old Stanley and his wife Elise Asher and that young couple who had bought his boyhood home was a life-changing event for everyone. That day, Carol and Greg Stockmall invited him into the stucco house his mother built. Imagine walking into your childhood home after a six-decade absence. What happened that day was the beginning of a 20-year friendship. When Greg overheard Stanley tell Elise about the delicious pears from the tree that he and his mother had planted when the house was being built, Greg said, the tree is still there and it still does have the most delicious pear you've ever tasted. The Stockmiles decided to send him that gift of pears every year, which they did for 20 years. The pear tree became a symbol of their friendship. And when Stanley wrote, my mother's pears. He dedicated it to the stock malls. Let's think about the lines, she proposed for her children's sake to marry again, not knowing how soon the windows would grow dark and the velvet drapes come down. Although it sounds as if the, the widow, Yetta Kunitz, married Stanley's stepfather, Mark Dine, and then moved right into Four Woodford Street, they were actually married when Stanley was five years old in 1910. So he had nine very happy years with his beloved stepfather. It is interesting uh, to note that his name change from Solomon seemed to, to Stanley uh, seemed to happen when he started school as a five-year-old and around the time of Yetta's marriage to Mark Dine. So why was for Woodford Street the house of sorrows? The suicide of Stanley's father two months before he was born was likely enough to justify the, the fact that he was born into sorrow. But the poem, as he tells you, there is more. Records show that tragically, two weeks after the mortgage was signed for Woodford Street, his stepfather Mark Dine was hanging drapes in the front room and died from a heart attack. Yetta struggled to keep the house for the next six years, but in 1925 was forced to sign over her half of the property to co-owner co Molly Siff. My mother's pears, plump green gold Worcester's pride, transported through autumn skies in a box marked handle with care. 
sleep 18 Bartlett pairs, hand-picked and polished and packed for deposit at my door, each in its crinkled nest with a stub of stem attached and a single bright leaf like a flag, a smaller than usual crop, but still enough to share with me at, as always at harvest time. Those strangers are my friends whose kindness blesses the house my mother built at the edge of town beyond the last trolley stop when the century was young. And she proposed for her children's sake to marry again, not knowing how soon the windows would grow dark and the velvet drapes come down. Rubble accumulates in the yard. Workmen are hammering on the roof. I am standing knee deep in dirt with a shovel in my hand. Mother has wrapped a kerchief round her head, her glasses glint in the sun. When my sisters appear on the scene, gangly and softly tittering, she waves them back into the house to fetch us pails of water, and they skip out of our sight in their matching midi blouses. I summon up all my strength to set the pear tree in the ground, unwinding its burlap shroud. It is taller than I, Make room for the roots, my mother cries. Dig the hole deeper. In 2009, my home was designated a literary landmark by the American Library Association. It's one of five sites in Massachusetts and approximately 110 in the nation. In memory of my husband, Greg, I donated correspondence and memorabilia from our 20-year friendship with Stanley and his wife, Elise, to Clark University archives and special collections so that researchers can learn about this part of his life. During the months of May through October, I welcomed small groups for docent tours at 4 Whitford Street, which lasts about one hour and are free. If you are part of a group interested in literary and architectural history, please take a flyer from the back table and contact me to make arrangements. Thank you for being a great audience. I thought I would read a poem of Stanley Kunitz's today. It's called The Snakes of September. All summer I heard them rustling in the shrubbery outracing me from tier to tier in my garden. A whisper among the viburnans, a signal flashed from the hedgerow, a shadow pulsing in the barberry thicket. Now that the nights are chill and the annuals spent, I should have thought them gone in a torpor of blood, slipped to the netherworld before the sickle frost. Not so. In the deceptive balm of noon, as if defiant of the curse that spoiled another garden, these two appear on show through a narrow slit in the dense green brocade of a north country spruce, dangling head down, entwined in a brazen love knot. I put out my hand and stroke the fine, dry grit of their skins. After all, we are partners in this land, co-signers of a covenant. At my touch, the wild braid of creation trembles. And I'll read a short, early poem of mine that has a snake in it. Um, but. I was thinking a lot about activism, and uh, I was at Kent State in 1970, and that creates a very different kind of activism that you can ask me about someday. This poem is called Vigilance. That day I walked alone in swampy woods. Loose strife freed its spires of purple, while cattails kept their velvety secrets. Beneath the pond's shimmer, tadpoles swam, changing into bigger prey. I knew down deep the water snake slithered between slender stems. 
in the dead pine, leaning against a darkening sky. A blue heron sat, statue still. I moved closer until he became like you, all feathers and flight. Thank you. Mid-March and the sycamore still celebrates ornamented at Christmas, but tarnished the tawny, tawny bells reminiscing their tidings. That's how I'd like to sing, soft as a plush burr, jarring no lightweight spell of mid-morning, just minding the fragile air, humming the whole good news. Circulation is our history, our bloodstream, the whiteness of our lives, the wholeness of our lives. It is all we know and how much it is. The recovering over and over and over again of our past. Through the act of our present, our future, nothing lost, nothing for long left behind, left only to be returned to, altered in the sense of added is recovered. Recover me, recover our time, over and over and over. Let the imperative rhyme with the lover. Thank you. And pear, apricot, then. The 